Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the end of chapter eight. So we've made it through this whole chapter where we're doing hypothesis testing using different types of tests, right? Z-test for a mean, T-test for a mean, Z-test for a proportion, and chi-square test for a standard deviation or variance. Section 8.6 brings it all together. It's called Additional Topics Regarding Hypothesis Testing. The notes should be relatively short. The idea is very large. So right here, this first thing, this is the relationship between confidence intervals and hypothesis testing. Well, confidence intervals was all of Chapter 7. Hypothesis testing was all of Chapter 8. We're bringing these two concepts, very big concepts, together and looking at the agreement between them. They support each other. So we're going to look at our result for our hypothesis test comes first, and then we're going to make a confidence interval and see that it agrees with what we decided. The decision, remember, is to reject or not reject H sub O. So if our H sub O is rejected, that means we don't like it, right? We don't like that mu is equal to 86, or we don't like that p is equal to 0.21. So if the null hypothesis is rejected, when we make a confidence interval, the confidence interval will not contain our hypothesized mean. Will not. Our hypothesized mean is from H sub O, whatever we thought that the mean was going to be. So H sub O. We're always going to use the same confidence level or significance level. So if we're 95% confidence, we're going to use confident, we're going to use an alpha of 0.05. Our, if we did not reject our H sub O, so we like it, we like that our standard deviation is 25. That means our confidence interval does contain the hypothesized mean or proportion or whatever that was for that H sub O. So it will contain it. So, right, if, if we like it, we don't reject it, our, high, our confidence interval should be centered around that mean or standard deviation or proportion. So the purpose of doing this is to verify our hypothesis test with a confidence interval. It's a double check. It's knowing that we did this hypothesis right. All of our data agrees with our decision to reject or not reject. The two must be in agreement. So if we do not reject the H sub O, but our mean is not in that interval, something went wrong, our data is bad, our calculation's bad, something is not right. And this connection, we only do this for two-tailed tests. So I know that we are doing two different methods of hypothesis testing. We could do the traditional value with a critical value, traditional method with a critical value, or we could do the p-value with the area under the curve. I'm not a super big fan of doing the p-value with a two-tailed test because I think that uh, people get confused between are we dividing alpha by 2 or are we doubling the p. I like to divide the alpha by 2. So you're going to have an option at this point. Do you want to use the traditional method or the p-value? So I've got a few things to say here, and I have a few things that are not actually in the notes, but I want to just make sure that you see and think about all these things. So I mentioned this already. The hypothesis test and the confidence interval must be at the same level. So for our confidence interval, if we're going to be 90% confident, that means we're going to use an alpha of 0 0.10. Right, so we just have to make sure that we're consistent. You can't switch it up and expect everything to agree. That just doesn't even make sense if you think about it. So a couple of things here, a couple of refreshers. We need to go back in time for just a moment. So a confidence interval when sigma is known or our sample size is greater than or equal to 30. So remember, I've been kind of saying this over and over and talking about it. I'm going to put the actual confidence interval up here. And I should have put parentheses around this just because it's just a little messy. We made this confidence interval in section 7.1. 
We did the hypothesis testing when sigma was known in section 8.2. So remember, we did x bar plus and minus our z value, our critical value, um, times our sigma over the square root of n. You know all that information. That was a throwback. That's in your notes for section 7.1. Confidence interval for when sigma is not known. Right? That's when we use our t values or our t table instead. So here's what our confidence interval looks like. And again, I should have put parentheses around this. Remember how we talked about back in um, section 7.2 about how really it's the same formula. We use a T instead of a Z for our critical value. It's still the standard deviation. It's just a sample instead of a population over the square root of N, X bar plus and minus that. We made these hypothesis tests in section 8.3. Whoops, section 8.3. And we can go on and on, and I will because that's what I do. So you, this confidence interval is nothing new. We did this back in section 7.1 and 7.2. So you just need to go back and do a quick chapter 7 refresher. So, first thing you need to do is you need to make a decision about what type of hypothesis test you're going to do or what kind of confidence interval you're going to be using. Do you know sigma? Do you have a standard de uh, population standard deviation or sample standard deviation? Are you given the variance? You need to know where am I going. So, that decision is based on the data given. Do you know sigma? I didn't have a sigma symbol. If so, you're going to go to, and you're using uh, mean, you're going to go to section 7, 1, and 8, 2. Start with the confidence interval first. Nope. Start with the hypothesis test first. Do the confidence interval second to verify your decision, reject or do not reject. Are you given a proportion or a percentage? If you're given a proportion or a percentage, we're talking about a hypothesis test from section 8, 4. And we're talking about our confidence interval from section 7.3. So that's a confidence, or that's a um, percentage or a proportion. Is the problem based on variance or standard deviation? If it is, then you are going to um, section 8.5 for your hypothesis test and section 7.4 for your confidence intervals. So I didn't retype every confidence interval formula. You got to go back to chapter seven. Hopefully you've got those notes or look in the book. And last but not least, just something to think about. Are you going to use the traditional method of hypothesis testing or p-value? Again, like I mentioned, I'm not a super big fan. I mean, I like to do the p-value with a two-tailed, I do my alpha over two and then compare my p to alpha. Um, but if you're not, if that's confusing, if there's too much, use the traditional method. I'm sure that I've said somewhere along the line, no matter which method you do, your step two and three will look slightly different, but your reject or do not reject will be exactly the same. So as long as you do your calculations right, that's your decision. All right, so a lot of information, and like I said, the first thing you need to do is you need to figure out what kind of test this is, what type of hypothesis test. I like it when I highlight and it makes the words harder to see. So you need to go back and figure out, oh my gosh, is this, it's kind of like a chapter um, finale. Uh, do I, is this a T test? Is this a Z test? Is this a proportion? Is this where do I get my t, uh, critical value from? So let's say an example 15. I was supposed to change that name to flour. Flour is packed in five pound bags. An inspector suspects the bags may not contain five pounds of flour, right? That's a ripoff if it's less and you're getting a bonus if it's more. But we have to make sure that we've got the right amount of flour in each bag. A sample of 50 bags produces a mean of 4.6 pounds and a standard deviation of 0.7 pounds. 
Is there enough evidence to, that the, to conclude that the bags do not contain five pounds at the alpha equals 0.05 level? Also, find the confidence level at 95%, right? That does match up of the true mean. So this will always be the same. I'm never going to try to trick you. I probably wouldn't even say 95%. I'd probably just know that you knew that alpha equals 0.05 means 90% or 95% confidence level. So I did put here traditional method. I want to go through one example, but I'm going to kind of skim through it. So we're doing a hypothesis test. Um, let's see. Um, oops. So five pound bags, that's got to be my mean, right? The inspector suspects that the bags may not contain five pounds. Is there enough evidence to conclude that? So H sub O, my mean is equal to five pounds. The inspector thinks that it is not equal to five pounds, and that would be my claim. So that's what I'm looking for. Let's see, I've got a sample of 50 bags. So there's my N, produces a mean, so that's my X bar, and a standard deviation of 0 0.7 pounds. Here's the thing. That standard deviation is the same sentence as the sample of 50 bags with its mean. So this is an S, not a sigma. That tells us a lot because that tells us that this is a T test, not a Z. We don't know sigma. We only know S. So we've got to do ourselves a T test. So we don't need to do all of this and drag it out. I'm going to kind of skim through and tell you what I've got so that we can look at what this looks like. So when I went to step two, traditional method, I'm finding my critical value. It's two-tailed, right? So here's my mean. I think it's either higher or lower than five pounds. Two-tailed, which means my critical value has to be a positive and a negative. When I looked up 49 for my uh, degree of freedom with a two-tailed 95% confidence, I got a 2.014. So negative 2.014 and positive. Take a minute and make sure you know what we're talking about. When I did my t-test statistic, I plugged in all my stuff. So I took my x-bar, which was 4.6 minus 5, all over my standard deviation divided by my square root of n. Notice, even though my sample size is large, I still don't know sigma here. So that's why I'm doing t. I ended up calculating a negative 4.6. 0, 4, something like that. So again, let's just make sure that we know what this means in step 4. So negative 4.04, .04, if I drew that in there, that would be somewhere like around here. So what's our decision going to be? Are we going to reject or not reject H sub O? Looks to me like it's in the rejection region, right? Reject H sub O. So that means we do not like that the mean is equal to 5. I'm going to tell you right now that step five for this last section only, you can skip because we're going to make the confidence interval and comment on that. So skip step five for section eight, six. If I'm going too fast through this confidence uh, or through this hypothesis test, please go back to section seven, two, or sorry, section eight, three and check and see where these numbers are coming from. I'm now going to go to um, section 7.2 and make a confidence interval. So I'm going to use that formula that I typed in on the page before. So my x bar plus and minus, my t value, which I've got up there, right? So really, you've got everything you need, times your standard deviation over the square root of n. When I plus, uh, plug that all in, I hope I didn't mess you up with that. I already did the math. Let me tell you what I got for my confidence interval. Obviously, it's not going to go this quick, but um, I ended up with a 4.40 is less than mu 
which is less than 4.80. So I'm going to kind of scooch up here. Actually, I'll move this up so I can see better. So there's my confidence interval. The question I would ask you now is, does my um, decision from my hypothesis test agree with my confidence interval? Well, I did not like H sub O. This is bad, right? That was our decision, is that we don't like that meet the mean equals 5. When I look at this mean equals 5 for H sub O, when I look at this confidence interval, does 5 fall within my range? No, right? My range is from 4.4 to 4.8 pounds of flour per bag. So that is an agreement because we rejected this. We said that was bad. And then when we did the confidence interval, we're saying, oh, well, the um, average is somewhere lower than 5. It's between 4.4 and 4.8. So the hypothesis test and the confidence interval are in agreement Because, because, I'm going to switch colors here. We rejected H sub O, which is mu equals 5, and 5 is not in our interval. So if you think it through, it makes sense. We rejected H sub O. We do not like that mu is equal to 5, and 5 is not in our interval, so they are in agreement. Again, you don't have to write out step 5. All right. So um, I'm just going to do the one. A lot of this is going to be coming back to confidence intervals, remembering how to do those, going back to old notes, and then thinking about that. So I do have another example but I think we can just talk about that in class. Notice I do have p-value or p-method, p-value method for this one, but we can talk about those as we go. That is the overview. You got some seriously, um, a lot of information to put together. So this is your chance to come in tomorrow, the next day, whenever I see you, ask questions and like, let's make sure you are good to go. Thanks for sticking around. I enjoyed chapter eight with you. I can't wait to get to chapter nine.